on behalf of Japan Society, I'm glad to welcome you all to tonight's conversation. This will be a program that includes the fashion art collective CFGNY, um, comprised of Tin Nguyen, Daniel Chu, Kristen Kilpinen, and Ten Izu, as well as the fashion designer and artist Wataru Tominaga. And it will be moderated by Dr. Yunia Kawamura, professor of sociology at the Fashion Institute of Technology uh, here in New York. The talk is held in conjunction with our latest exhibition, Refashioning CFGNY and Wataru Tominaga, which I urge you to view um, in our gallery here on the second floor if you haven't had an opportunity already to see it. The exhibition will be on view until actually through uh, February 19th, 2023. Um, a few thank yous, so I'd particularly like to thank um, the gallery team, uh, first and foremost, for organizing this event, Ayaka Ida, Assistant Curator um, Da Chin Ta Sao, sorry, Da, Da, we call him Da, uh, Da Sao Exhibitions Manager, Stephanie O, Curatorial Assistant, as well as the entire Japan Society team for their help in bringing this program together. An immense thank you also to the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Booth Ferris Foundation, Shiseido Americas, the Lila Wallace Readers Digest Endowment Fund, Mary Griggs Burke Endowment Fund established by the Mary Livingston Griggs and Mary Griggs Burke Foundation, the Masako Mara and Koichi Mara PhD Fund for Education in the Arts, Peggy and Dick Danz Danziger, Terry Porte and Yasko Tashiro, and Friends of the Gallery. Thank you also to the Sandy Heck Lecture Fund and Japan Airlines. Tonight promises to be a spirited conversation uh, between the artist, designers, unpacking the practices, processes, techniques, and overall approaches to their multifaceted work, both within the realm of fashion, um, as well as how they are pushing at the boundaries of that medium and into new territory. With distinctive yet resonant themes explored in each of their practices, uh, racial and gender formation among them, we'll dive deeper into the critical space their practices are contributing to contemporary discourse. Um, and it's precisely new ideas like these that are at the center of Japan Society's mission, especially as our gallery continues to be a platform for increasingly diverse narratives and a global account of Japanese art and the art of the Japanese diaspora. Um, I'm enormously grateful to all of our speakers today who will be in discussion together. We will also reserve 10 or 15 minutes um, for a Q&A session at the end to open up a larger conversation with the wider audience, so all of you. And um, with that, I'd like to provide an abbreviated biography for each of our speakers tonight before welcoming them up to the stage. The New York-based fashion art label CFGNY began in 2016 as an ongoing dialogue between Tanuyan and Daniel Chu on the intersection of fashion, race, identity, and sexuality. Joined by Kirsten Kilponen and Tenizu in 2020, CFGNY continually returns to the term vaguely Asian, an understanding of racial identity as a specific cultural experience combined with the experience of being perceived as other. Through topics including the meaning of the Japanese term kawaii, their collections, among many others, um, their collections, art projects, and installations continue to explore the ongoing dialogue that seeps through the entire body of Asian American art. Wataru Tominaga is a Tokyo-based fashion and textile designer, best known for their distinctive textiles using vibrant colors and patterns. Born in Kumamoto, Japan, Tominaga is trained internationally, including at the Chelsea College of Art, Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design, Bunka Fashion College, University of Art and Design Helsinki, and Musashino Art University. Tominaga has worked under established design houses, um, including John Galliano for Mason Margiela, Eddie Peake, and Bless. In 2016, he won the Grand Jury Premier Vision Prize at the 31st International Festival of Fashion and Photography in Pierre um, in, in the south of France, and has since collaborated with brands including Petit Bateau and Mary Mecco. For their eponymous fashion label, um, which was established in 2019, Tominaga designs unisex garments that feature playful motifs and graphics 
um, which are inspired by wide-ranging time periods and cultures. Uh, Dr. Yunia Kawamura is professor of sociology at the Fashion Institute of Technology and visiting professor in the Graduate School of Design at the Polytechnic University of Milan. She is the author of many books, um, some of which include The Japanese Revolution in Paris Fashion, Fashioning Japanese Subcultures, and Fashionology, which has been translated into several foreign languages, uh, including uh, Italian, Swedish, and Russian. Her most recent publication is Cultural Appropriation in Fashion and Entertainment, uh, which came out this past July. Her research, research interests include fashion theory, hot couture, youth subcultures, ethnic dress, indigenous needlework workers, and social sustainability. She earned a PhD in sociology from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Columbia University, and was also professionally trained in fashion design um, and technical design at Bunka School of Fashion in Tokyo, um, Kingston University in London, and also at FIT here in New York. So please join me in giving our speakers a very warm welcome to the stage. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much to Japan Society for inviting me to moderate this session. It's really an honor to be with all these you know, really talented emerging uh, designers. So first off, um, I'd like to uh, talk about or you know, ask questions about your background. Uh, Wataru studied art uh, in Tokyo, and uh, Daniel, you studied uh, film studies at NYU, and uh, Tin studied art also, and uh, uh, the other two uh, who joined the group later, I'll have you know, questions for you as well. Uh, so my first question is, you know, um, you made a transition from art to fashion. Did you see like a link, some sort of link from uh, art to fashion? What was the transition like for you to get into the field of fashion? Would you like to okay, go first? Okay. Yeah. I start. I'm, I'm Wataru Tominaga. Nice to meet you. Thank you for ha be, having me here. And actually, like I wanted to study fashion from first uh, from first time when I was in high school too, but uh, uh, I wanted to go art school to see kind of different kind of creations. So I wanted to art go art university. Then, but uh, in Japan we don't really have good fashion course in art university. Mm -hmm. So I took a uh, art uh, uh, textile course, like textile art design course, and. So from the first, uh, I think it was, for me, it was planned to go to fashion after art school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I th yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm yeah. Kirsten. Um, yeah, I would say that we would all um, say that we're all artists that do fashion. And I think that we do fashion, well, one reason is because of its accessibility. Um, it's something that, compared to art, is a little bit more accessible around the world. Um, I th would say that we think of fashion as almost a language, a visual mm -hmm. language. And when you kind of have this almost universal language, it allows a lot more people, I guess, to be invited into the conversation. Um, and I think that would bring me to a second point, which is that we do enjoy how fashion brings people together, and it really helps us to, um, yeah, build a community um, from the moment we are producing a garment. Um, we are working one-on-one -on -one with tailors. Well, Tin most recently was working one-on-one -on -one with tailors in Vietnam. Um, to our fashion shows where we have models, we have, who else we have? Hairstylists, makeup artists, fashion, PR, choreographers, and the audience. We really use it as an opportunity to bring a lot of people together. Mm -hmm. I think just adding on top of that too, part of it was um, 
like in while I was in college during um, my first like after my first freshman year in college, I went to Vietnam, and during that time, I I did kind of bring bring paints, and I was making art like studio art when I was there during the summers. But I felt really isolated, and um, since I was young, my mom had gone between going to Vietnam and like living in the States with our family and she would get garments made um, for me and my sister. So I always knew there was a kind of industry that existed there that was um, kind of widespread because my mom also knows how to sew. Um, so yeah, I think we wanted to kind of use fashion because it was it allowed us to travel to Southeast Asia more um, and then also allowed us to yeah have a practice within the city that people were able, like KK said, to, to relate to. Because there is a contemporary art scene there, but it's quite limited, um, especially because, um, yeah, the government, it's communist. So it's it's kind of complex in terms of like what you're allowed to present there and um, yeah, what people are making and the conversations around it. So fashion has always been a kind of a way for us to participate um, in a way that could hold a lot of many like ideas, but then also I think um, in a superficial way, just very much be closed as well. Mm -hmm. I also would say that we come from um, artistic backgrounds that are like multimedia focused. We all come from different modes of production. And I think we see fashion as just another mode of, um, of like creating dialogue that we could also do through sculpture or through painting or through film or other means of like photography, but it's more accessible as KK and Tin have just said. Um, so we don't necessarily see ourselves as like an exclusively like fashion specific label, but instead are interested in exploiting fashion to talk about production diaspora, um, the movement of people and materials around the globe. Do you have something to add? <laughs> <laughs> I, think they, I think they pretty much said <laughs> everything that yeah, we okay, need so, to um, discover. Ten and Kirsten joined later in yes. 2020. Uh, why did you decide to join the duo? Um, I think it was a time that CFG and Y came to a point where they kind of needed some extra help. Yeah. It was also a point in my life where I wanted to take on a project like this. Um, and and you I, guys are already working with yeah, us I already years. Modeled. I think that's sort we of... We are both already modeled. I did a lot of CFGNY's photography outside of CFGNY. I knew that I worked well with Daniel already, so it was kind of an easy thing to mm -hmm. jump into. Can you tell us your overall you know, creative process? Now, do you start with uh, you know mm -hmm. sketching, or do you decide on fabrics and textile first? I think with Wataru, you know, you work solo, so I think you can pretty much decide in everything yourself. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, you guys are group, so I mean, how do you come up with like the final product, or so, you know, final collection? Wataru well, should start. Yeah, yeah. Watu, yeah. you should go first. Yeah. 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 I mean, I always try to find something like kind of unconventional uh, combination mm -hmm. of texture and color or uh, silhouette and uh, textile mm -hmm. and and uh, I always uh, try to find something from the history so I mm -hmm. always look a lot look a lot uh, into old magazines mm -hmm. or uh, old advertisement which I can see some hint of some masculinity and uh, femininity and then I always try to combine like combine them together and I always try to make uh, something not too masculine and not too feminine and yeah I think that is kind of process. So you come up with a concept then yeah. decide on like the textiles and fabrics and colors later? Yeah I think yeah it's not like like really concept but it's more like visual concept uh -huh. like yeah so I kind of make uh, yeah mood board or something mood board. yeah okay. in the fa at first then yeah try to build from that yeah I see yeah. okay what about CFGNY? 
Um, it I takes more time, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I would say that we actually, uh, there's a lot of ways to get started, but in our past, a lot of times we've actually started with the fabric itself. Uh -huh. um, we'll comb through like thousands and thousands <laughs> and thousands and thousands of different fabrics mm -hmm. and select, you know, what we think people might like. Um, we also select like the ugliest fabrics mm -hmm. we've ever like ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that we try to do. <laughs> um, you intentionally look for the yeah. ugliest like fabric yeah, <laughs> to yeah. work on. So we start off with these interesting fabrics and I would say from there the fabrics already have some sort of constraint. So, you know, if you have some very thin, stretchy fabric, that's not gonna be good for pants. If you have some very thick, warm fabric, that's gonna be good for jackets. So we really select fabrics and go one by one and kind of all suggest like, what would this fabric be good for? And then it, yeah, yeah it evolves from there. Yeah, we fight sometimes. <laughs> yeah. We have like a, we're in like a really insane <laughs> chat room that just yes. goes on like every day, yes. all day long. It's and it's like, like our both work related up. and personal. <laughs> and, um, yeah. But we're always kind of throwing ideas in there just because yeah. I think often we feel like if we don't, they'll kind of get lost and it's sort of like a way to remind each other. Um, yeah. We do a lot of like quick like even just taking a photo of something blurry on the street and then on the like phone app, you can like very shakily draw another shape over that image and we'll send it to the group chat and from there it'll actually turn into a garment sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're just mostly interested in sort of like the, com the, co the constant conversation that we're having and out of this conversation, like things sort of form out of yeah. it basically. Mm -hmm. I think what's also been interesting because before when, when it was just Daniel and I, it was very much like, my opinion or his, or if we agreed or disagreed. And now that there's four, we often vote. Um, yeah. So then I'm just like, okay, well, three out of four want this. It's happening. So or, <laughs> yeah, and then I think even if everyone votes on something, I often will just keep bringing up points and I'll just say like, well, I talked to these people. And they, they think this as well. So we also try to persuade each other yeah. into directions and kind of uh, justify, I guess, our opinions. So you worked with fabrics and textiles first, unlike Una Wataru, who has like a mood board. Yeah, so like this last collection, well the collection that we're gonna be showing here in fa uh, at the end of January, um, it's our first collection between the four of us that is like a proper runway show. And for this um, collection, I traveled to Vietnam by myself. Mm -hmm. Normally Daniel and I go and sample. So we kind of had to come up with a new method of how to design collectively, because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to just be kind of my voice because I was there doing production. Mm -hmm. Like I speak Vietnamese and I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of physical body there doing it. Um, so, and it kind of worked in the end. I was so, yeah. I think we were all so surprised that we were all able to kind of design and our voices were able to kind of pull through. And mm -hmm. it just, I was, we were, I think, yeah, we're kind of really organized on the computer. So what I would do is I'd go to certain districts in Vietnam because there's all different areas with um, different kinds of fabric markets. So I would just stick to one area because there's like hundreds of shops and I would kind of go through and I would take photos of every fabric that I thought any of them would like and I would take photos of the street so I kind of knew where I was and then I would upload them and then they would kind of go through and circle which fabrics they liked and then the next day because I'd go back. Because of the time difference. Yeah, because we're kind of running on a 12 hour time difference. So I would upload those in the evening and then when I'd go to the bed, they would wake up and circle which ones they liked. And then I'd go back and then I would buy them. And basically we just did this with every part of the design from the garment or so from the fabrics to all the hardware to the sampling, then I'd have people try it on, we'd take photos, and then they would all kind of make adjustments depending on what things looked like. Yeah, we would text all day, every day, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's just <laughs> every second we could, we'd be texting each other or yeah. calling each other. Yeah. So, so what's our, for you, for your case, you decide everything by yourself? Do you have More assistants or peers that you can talk to? Yeah. And, uh, because I 
studied mostly print design and yeah. fashion design. So I don't know about knitting mm -hmm. or, uh, yeah, mainly knitting. I don't know so much about. Mm -hmm. So I have kind of s someone who I can consult. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I always ask like uh, what, what I want and then and they suggest kind of techniques. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I have someone yeah, to decide okay, together okay. too. <laughs> um, you know, these two brands are really interesting pieces in the exhibition. So I have a question that's more specific. You know, uh, what are you have this, you know, outfit, you know, uh, where you put like hot uh, heat tapes mm -hmm. on the plates. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm curious how you actually came up with that idea. And, you know, with, y with you, um, uh, you have that outfit with, uh, you know, stuffed, you know, um, animals. Oh. I'm curious as to how you you guys actually came up with that, you know, design. You know, do you want to talk mm, about the yeah. like the source of inspiration, you know, both of you? Uh, I, okay. Do you I yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that piece, like, I always like some kind of texture or visual image which have, uh, which I can feel like the uh, process. Uh, that I can see many layers mm -hmm. of process, like. Uh, uh, even like painting, I like uh, some painting like worked over and over again. And uh, the textile uh, design uh, in the exhibition, uh, at that time I was trying to find something, uh, some kind of technique. I can mix like texture and print design together mm -hmm. because I wanted to. Uh, that Actually, that collection I made mostly for men mm -hmm. because uh, I, at that time I was thinking like for men's where we don't really have like decorative fabric or interesting mm -hmm. fabric on clothes. Then I wanted to try to mix like print, a print, printing with some print design. And then I was experimenting with different kind of uh, techniques and I found that technique at school, so, mm -hmm. yeah, it was just by process, yeah. So using like heat tapes just like popped yeah. up in your mind? Like I mean, I, I was trying it somewhere almost store? everything, mm -hmm. like I, w I tried like printing with uh, heat transfer printing and yeah, not only tape, like I tried silk screen printing on printing as well. But the tape worked uh, really well, so yeah, I chose that one in the end. Actually, yeah. okay. I always so I always do that kind of experiment. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Covering. Okay. So what about CFJ and why with the, you know, the 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 stuffed toys? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, dress? actually, aside from clothes, we do make standalone stuffed animals. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the dress you're talking about is. We call it the bump dress, yeah, yeah. and it's basically influenced by a collection from the 90s by Comme des Garçons. Yes. <laughs> I think it's even called Bumps and Bumps, uh, right? No, it's called Body Meets Form. It's called yeah. Body Meets Form. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if you were to see the runway show, you would see these models in sort of these tight fabrics. They have these sort of bulging mounds that look very sort of soft or squishy coming off their back or on their sides. So the usual type of like human form you think you would see um, coming down the runway is actually very um, abstracted. But um, yes, of course we put our CFG and Y twist on that and we made our lumps and bumps out of stuffed animals. <laughs> and we made sure that the dresses were a little bit sheer so you could really see mm -hmm. those stuffed animals inside. Um, yeah, and we put like, I don't know, bootleg Pikachu in there, <laughs> maybe Hello Kitty, some other unrecognizable things. Yeah, and I think it was like uh, also inspired by um, this theorist that we were reading at the time, Sian Nagai. Um, she's like an affect theorist and she sort of talks about the way in which like cute things um, provoke a sort of like 
uh, a feeling of sort of like wanting to take care, but also wanting to destroy at the same time, like a grotesque feeling, but also like a sort of like loving feeling. And we wanted to sort of like emphasize the sort of like grotesque and the cuteness at the same time. So we made them into sort of these like, we made these animals into sort of like grotesque tumor-like forms that are still kind of cute or something, mm -hmm. yeah. Kind of based off um, like the saying, it's like when when someone's like approaching a baby and they're like, you're so cute, I want to eat you. So it's like <laughs> that these like stuffed animals like become part of like your internal self. <laughs> okay, so, so is that the message that you want the audience to take away from your, <laughs> your dress with the, the, the toys or? I think it was more that it was like a commentary more so on like a gendered and racialized mm -hmm. or a racialized body that then is inherently gendered um, and this kind of grotesqueness that comes from at once being like despised and infantilized um, at the same time. Yeah, what are, was there any particular message that you wanted to convey through your dress with these heat tapes? Um. Message, I, it's very difficult to, but uh, um, I got influenced uh, uh, by the designer called Madame Goulet yes. for pleating. Pleats, yes. And uh, I always, I think it's kind of similar story, but I, I always like beautiful thing, like me, very delicate thing, but I always at the same time like really like uh, so something cheap looking uh, toys as well, or some uniforms, which is not really uh, expensive. And uh, I kind of wanted to mix that kind of like pleated, beautiful pleated textile with like bold like stripes. Uh, with, uh, the stripes are actually came from kind of rugby shirts. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I don't really have kind of like message by words mm -hmm. but uh, yeah I always try to yeah, mix different type mm -hmm. of things and yeah okay yeah I also uh, would like to raise the, the concept of race ethnicity obviously it's very important you know for for the designers uh, especially you know for CFGNY uh, vaguely Asia uh, vaguely Asian is your central theme so obviously it's very important um, but do you always have that, you know, that concept of race and ethnicity at the back of your mind during your creative process? And, you know, it, do you think there is, this is a you know, provocative question, but is there like a danger of being like, you know, too ethnocentric that you're really pushing, you know, Asian, you know, the concept of Asian or vaguely Asian, like, you know, forward to the audience? Um, I think why we started the project was basically to try to sort of, um, I think it was like me and Tin were drawn to each other because I think we were having questions about sort of like our Asian-ness, I would say, um, at the time. And we sort of found this very interesting conversation that happened between us where we could sort of work things out about like these weird sort of like alienations that we felt being race um, or like fe feelings of competition that we potentially had with each other because we were like kind of like set within like a very white world and when there, you're sort of like tokenized within like a more white world like I think there is a tendency to like be competitive with other who, other people who you, you feel like you're kind of competing for to be the token or something and I think like we started CFGNY as a way to sort of like why don't we sort of have moments of solidarity with each other? Why don't we actually collaborate with each other? Um, and I think it's important for us that this isn't, that it is important for us to have this conversation about Asianness with only other, like with Asian people, because like the way in which we're racialized is very different from someone who's black is racialized and someone who's Latino is racialized. And there is very specific experiences that each of those things have that like, you know, we, I think we have to work through uh, among ourselves before we can even have a larger conversation of trying to have solidarities with like other races, I would say. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think, I'm not scared of being called ethnocentric because um, that's like, yeah, in all honesty, there is sort of like 
specific problems that we as an Asian community face that are particular to us. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to sort of like work through that with the project. Mm -hmm. I also think that we approach this term Asian in the same way that we approach fashion in that we use it as this kind of like boundary object or this flexible term that we're in a lot of our work, we're unpacking how even the idea of Asian is entirely relational and there's no core essence or authenticity or core truth to what Asian even means or can be comprised of. And we see throughout, for example, the work we have in our show is kind of about this fabrication of identity through all of these policy decisions and the flow of bodies and materials around the world. Um, so I think that we use vaguely Asian in the most like expansive and like pro pluralistic form possible rather mm -hmm. than this kind of like monolithic or narrowing term of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question uh, for you too, Ataru. Um, is race ethnicity important in your work too? And do you, mm. did you ever identify yourself as an Asian designer before you went overseas? Um, in Japan, I think it's different context mm. I have because uh, as Japanese, I have never really felt uh, I'm Asian <laughs> growing up I know in exactly Japan what you mean, yeah. because everyone looks like Asian, like most of everyone. And of course we have different kind of race, but not as much as diverse in here. So I think when I realized I'm categorized as, as Asian is maybe when, was, uh, when I studied in Helsinki first time in Europe. And uh, I don't know, since then, I, I was also thinking kind of what, what is like Asian-ness, but uh, I never really used that concept for my work mm -hmm. um, because I didn't really uh, feel that, I, I, I didn't really feel it's really re real mm -hmm. for me to, to be called just Asian, like, so, yeah, it's, of course it's important for me like to think about race, but uh, yeah, I think, I, I don't think I can really say like I'm Asian designer. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like Jap I, I, I'm more like Japanese designer maybe, because in the fashion history in Europe, there is kind of certain context of Japanese designer and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I got to influence more from that Japanese context rather than like all Asian uh, mm -hmm. categorization, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And another uh, important uh, concept in your work is uh, obviously gender and sexuality, isn't it? Um, how do you express or integrate, incorporate? that idea through your work? Me? Gender, yeah. Okay. For you and <laughs> okay, okay, gender, yes. gender, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like everything kind of, every object mm -hmm. or every visual image have kind of gender to me. Like I always feel like gender if I see image or object or texture. Okay. Like, I, oh, it's, maybe it's quite feminine or it's quite, like masculine, or it's oh, I, it's quite mixed and well balanced. And then I always try to make something uh, comfortable for me uh, to say that this is like gender fluid or something. And uh, yeah, okay. So I try to yeah, like. S s uh, yeah, build something not just masculine or feminine. So you do um, try to break that gender boundary very purposefully. Yeah, I, I tried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is always like mm -hmm. what I'm thinking. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. What about CFG and why? Um, I think yeah, like we're it just yeah we're I think we're just sort of making things and when it gets to like a styling phase, like although we make certain things that 
look more like female clothes or look so make certain things that look more like male clothes. We're like a little bit unafraid to sort of like style whatever garment to whatever person it fits to, you know. So uh, like this this purple dress that we talked about earlier, you see in the pictures, it's styled on a man. Um, and I think it's just sort of like we just in the same way that Wataru is just very free in playing with sort of like these distinctions where just a little, we just don't necessarily yeah adhere to those distinctions mm -hmm. so much and it's just sort of like wanting to open up a space where we can be free okay. in putting anything on anyone mm -hmm. and then in that way sort of like ungendering our clothes in some way ungendering a dress you know mm -hmm. why can't a man wear a dress you know? mm -hmm. okay and uh, your generation is uh, the one that really emphasizes you know sustainability right so how do you incorporate sustainability, whether it's you know, ecological or social sustainability in your work? Um, for me, I try not to produce my clothing outside Japan, actually. I'm making everything in Japan. Okay. And uh, I think that is, for me, quite important. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also kind of not to sell outside of Japan so much, actually. I yeah, I try to ship, uh, I mean, I try to send uh, my product, uh, yeah, more in Japan, like less in, like overseas. You are not all that interested in expanding to the international market? I mean, I'm interested in, but uh, I prefer like um, having communication when I sell my product mm -hmm. to the shop. So, I sometimes get message from like buyers outside of Japan, but uh, I prefer meeting people in person first. Mm -hmm. Then, yeah. Or if uh, the shop is, seems really good for me, maybe I try, but uh, I have never had that good shop to me. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm saying only in Japan now. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What about CFG and um, I think in fashion, there's a lot of brands and designers who heavily rely on factories. Um, I mean, they're running on a business model, so they're basically trying to maximize profit, minimize cost. Mm. And in that process, there's like a lot of excess waste produced. So in fast fashion, there's a lot of, a lot of excess. So mm. I think that because we keep production in Vietnam, sometimes in the US, we don't really see ourselves as participating in that. No, I think we're, we're, we're such a small label. We don't actually produce that many clothes. Like I think this conversation around sustainability is really for these like big conglomerate factories and like big brands who are making like millions or you know, like hundreds of thousands of pieces. And we're definitely not going through that much material. We're definitely not, making that much clothes and therefore we're not making that much waste also at the same time either um and so i don't know if we'd necessarily call ourselves sustainable like we wouldn't brand ourselves as being sustainable but we are just because we're we're small and just like lots of it's like keeping it local and small and like people that we know and familiar with like mm -hmm. that is just sustainable mm -hmm. you know because we're not trying to be this huge thing <laughs> And I think to your question about social sustainability, it's where really like the reason why CFDNY is a like inherently a collective at its core is because we're interested in maintaining and building these kind of like long lasting relationships that are both like in New York and now like spreading out more and more. But like for example, for our shows, like we plan to have the same, some of the same models return because they're such important like parts of what CFDNY is at the core and like mm -hmm. our other collaborators we continue to collaborate with or be in touch with in other ways. And so it is really about like this like kind of core CFGNY, but it's also a social project as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we go to the uh, Q&A session with the audience, you know, one last quick question. What are your future plans and goals? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. we're gonna have a fashion show here in January. Oh, okay, that's, that's great. one of them. Okay. We're, we have some exhibitions coming up. Right? Um, in the next year? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have things, but I don't oh, know. Oh, we want to do painting, remember? <laughs> <laughs> we want to do painting next. 
<laughs> yeah, I think we're planning to produce and distribute clothing a little bit more, and mm -hmm. we're also kind of collectively producing artwork in the studio, so. Okay. Yeah, we have some projects coming yeah. up. What about you? What are, what are your future plans? Um, I think I want to continue my own label, mm -hmm. like not too big, but not too small, right? Mm -hmm. And then I also, like, I noticed that I really like showing in this kind of gallery space mm -hmm. too. So I want, I actually studied fine art one year too. So I was making sculptures before as well. So I, I would like to uh, expand a bit more my art practice as well in the future. At the same time, yeah, so as fashion. Okay, thank you very much for all that. It was very interesting and informative. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think we we'll, can open up the floor to, uh, uh, to the audience. Questions? My question was, how do you know when something that you've created is good? Or is good not really like a measure that concerns you? Like, how do you know when you feel really good about something that you've made? <laughs> well, I think um, with with creating anything, not everything you're going to make is going to be good. <laughs> um, but um, I don't know. I think like if some I don't I how I judge something as good is if I'm really happy with it, and I yeah, um, and I hope that other people respond to it in the same way. But it's always yeah. I think the process of creation is just sort of like you never know. Yeah. I think you also need to have some a little bit of distance from it, and then if you revisit it and you're like, oh wow, I did that, like, <laughs> it's good. Yeah, how about you? Um, how do you know when something is good? I, I always just make for kind of opportunity, and then I let it go, and then I see the reaction too. Because I always, I, I've never really liked my work, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> like in the past years, but then, like, I think, I think I gradually like liking it. Like, maybe past few years, past maybe five years. And then, but sometimes like, I feel like if I show it, like, people react completely different things mm -hmm. to me. And then, of course, I think, as, as Daniel said, I, I, if I feel happy, like I think it's good work. Mm -hmm. But I think if I'm, if it's, if I'm not even like happy, I think it, if you let it go to the sh uh, show or something, I think uh, you can find something else too, like rather than just being happy for making. So, mm -hmm. I mean, of course, uh, like. If everyone happy with the work, I think it's good work. But uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, many times <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like I, I don't really, s I, yeah, think about it too much. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. don't think about it. I think we also, or at least <laughs> I, um, gauge how much I like something by how much I laugh at it. <laughs> 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 like how much a piece of clothing makes me laugh. <laughs> if it's making yeah. me laugh a lot, then I'm like, yeah, this is this is a good piece. Yeah. I think we also tell each other. I'm just like, this needs more work. <laughs> so I keep going. Or we're all kind of like, we should stop. So yeah. I think yeah. there's a kind of collective feeling around something. I think for, for me, like, just, like, continuing, mm -hmm. like, activity is more important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then gradually, like, I can like it. Like, uh -huh. after many years, like, I if I didn't like first time seeing it, but... Mm -hmm. uh, then in many years, like sometimes I like Maybe it. Maybe you like so it mm -hmm. yeah. five years later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Yeah. Do you consciously think of traditional Japanese clothing when you're working? And if not consciously, do you see elements of traditional Japanese clothing in your work as it seems to naturally develop? Me, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't think consciously I'm, yeah, the influence of Japanese, 
But when I think about closing, I prefer s something more flat and mm. something more apart from the body, which is a bit different from, yeah. it, which is completely opposite of European mm -hmm. fashion. So I don't know, maybe growing up in Japan, like I was kind of influenced by the mm -hmm. aesthetic or, yeah. Yeah, I actually have that question to everyone. Um, do you think it's an advantage for us Asians, the fact that we don't have any history in Western dress, and therefore we can be more daring and experimental because we're not confined to its history? I mean, I think for CFG and Y, that question's a little difficult because we're all Asian American. Mm -hmm. So at the same time that we're Asian, we're also okay, American. Yeah. Um, in the US, we're seen as Asian. If we go to Asia, or like yeah, the Philippines, American. for example, I'm um, American, yeah. I'm Mestiza. So I think for us, that Western culture is still very much embedded mm -hmm. within us all. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard for us to mm -hmm. escape. Oh. But I would say that like actually like because Japanese fashion is such a thing within the within like the fashion world, it has like even though well ten is half Japanese, but even though none of us are Japanese, I think we all somehow look to Japanese fashion as an mm -hmm. influence because of the way in which it's played like sort of like the role of Asianness within the fashion world for so long, you know, mm -hmm. and we somehow like even though we're yeah even though we're not ethically Japanese, we like somehow feel some type of connection and solidarity to that. I would say like in Vietnam, um, when Daniel and I first started going there, because <laughs> Daniel would wear like oversized shorts, they would always kind of assume that we were Japanese <laughs> just because of the way that we were kind of styled. Um, so yeah, there is a kind of relationship I think even there to Japanese fashion. Yeah, and, and more so now, I think, to Korean fashion. So when you say a relation to Japanese fashion, are you talking about Japanese fashion of the 80s. post war 20th century? Or are you talking about, it doesn't sound like you're talking about kimono and haori and samurai dress and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I post think it would be like post war. Yeah. It would be yeah. mostly like 80s, actually, like yeah. Kamigasan, san Yoji Yamamoto, Isamiyaki like that sort of wave of Japanese yeah. fashion that okay. broke into the Western world, kind right. of. And like so. streetwear. And but I, and also streetwear. I also think that because of the like flow of the image of a Japanese person in like traditional Japanese clothing, meaning older Japanese clothing, has been so like washed around the world, especially to like Europe and the US since like the late 1800s, there is this kind of, which is what CFNY is interested in, is how clothing combined with race paints this image of a person before you know anything about them. For example, what Tin was saying about being perceived as Japanese because of a styling system, or if you see a person with like yellow skin wearing like a larger coat, like you will racialize them in this specific kind of way because of these histories of perceiving. You have more questions, but I will give other people a chance. Anyone else? So as a consumer, you know, fabric is very important to me. You know, I prefer cotton, but for designer, like when it comes to fabric, and I heard that it was mentioned during the conversation, um, what is the thought process behind using a certain fabric when you're designing something? Sorry, I did not understand. What is that? So when you're yeah. designing something, what is the, like, when you're going through the concept, what is the importance of the fabric? What is the importance of fabric? What is your thought process? In the thought process? Thought process. I think, mm, for me, like, texture, texture of uh, fabric is quite important, like, that that speaks me to me a lot. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't use so much like thinner or see-through fabric, mm -hmm. which is quite feminine. I prefer using f more like cotton canvas, or cotton Oxford, 
which is my use for like workwear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I always print on top of it. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think with us, it's like I think we like the challenge of um, just being drawn to something and then trying to work around it, basically. Um, just like how KK said earlier, like we like to pick the ugliest fabric and try to make it tasteful in some way. I think that's yeah. part of what our process is. Or like, I, I think yeah. it's a relationship between that, but then also, mm -hmm. um, like because none of us are trained in fashion. I mean, we we know how to sew at this point, but we work with these tailors in Vietnam a lot of what we end up making is kind of based off their um, capabilities. So they'll often just, they'll say, this will be too difficult to sew in this material. Can we try this other thing? So it's kind of a conversation that we have with them. Thank you, thank you. Mm. I guess um, we need to wrap this up. So thank you very much. So sorry. <laughs> Before um, last Saturday, I noticed there's a Scandinavian influence, and I just and you mentioned you stay in um, Finland before, right? And uh, I, you know, I could see that in your designs. So just a comment. Ah, oh, thank you so much. Did yeah, you do I that intentionally, so or uh, um, this is a new design influence, maybe like not inspiration for you? Intentionally, but I always like. Uh, I don't know how to, uh, it's not really intentionally, but uh, like Scandinavian, I think ma mostly like Marimekko mm -hmm. is the biggest brand in Scandinavia. And uh, they use very like colorful and yes. painterly like motifs in the, Big, in big piece of fabric and then they make like huge dress or something and uh, I really like, like yeah visually so I think I get the influence naturally and then not, not like intentionally but yeah thank you yeah so, yes so we can we need to wrap this up thank you so much the speakers for these great <laughs> comments <laughs> thank you um, yeah, thanks yeah, so thank you very much <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming.